Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session on competition and industrial policy post COVID-19. My name is Raul Bajo, and I am an associate professor of economics at the School of Economics uh, at the University of Navarra School of Economics. And I am, I am also the deputy director of the MEF, that is the Masters uh, in Economics and Finance here at the University of Navarra. In, in fact, this, uh, this event, uh, which is part of this Stop and Think uh, webinar series, has been put in place to a great extent uh, by the committee of the MEF. And this committee is led by Professor Antonio Moreno, which is, who is the director of the program. And the MEF is the graduate program, uh, research-oriented graduate program here at the, the School of Economics uh, of the University of Navarra. And we aim at training future researchers and policymakers in economics and finance. And actually, last year we celebrated our 20th anniversary, 20th, 20th anniversary of the program. So at the MEF, we are uh, extremely interested in hot and relevant topics related to research in economics and finance. And certainly, COVID-19 fits into this category. In particular, the discussion today will focus around the implications for the COVID-19 crisis, crisis and its aftermath for industrial policy with a focus on innovation, big tech, competition, and so on. For that matter, we have today three very impressive speakers. First, today, uh, today we have a Professor Luis Cabral, who is the Paganelli and Bull Professor at the NYU Stern Business School. And he also serves as, as the Chair of the Economics Department at the same business school. Second, today we have Professor Xavier Vives. He's a, an economics and finance professor at Yes, a school, uh, school of Business in Barcelona. And he also serves as the Averti Chair of Regulation, Competition and Public Policy. And he's also the Academic Director of the Public Private Research Center, Center at the Yes business, business School. Finally, we have also today Professor Pedro Mendy, who is a colleague of mine, actually. He's a Professor of Economics at here at the Econ Department in the University of Navarra. And he also serves as the Vice Dean for Research at the School of Economics and Business Administration. Having said that, each panelist now, I'm gonna hand over to them. So each panelist is gonna have around 10 to 15 minutes to present their views on these topics. And then after that, these uh, speeches are gonna, follow, are gonna be followed by a panel discussion, discussion of about 10 to 15 minutes. So we're gonna have this Q&A session after the three presentations. And so if you're interested, and this is a message for all, all the participants in this session, if you're interested in, if you want to uh, answer, uh, sorry, answer, uh, if you want to raise a question, to each of the panelists, please go to the Q&A &A button in Zoom and place your question there. Having said that, now I hand, the, uh, I, uh, I hand over to Professor Luis Cabral. So Professor Luis Cabral, the floor is yours now, or better, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you for inv inviting me. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And in fact, I will, uh, will uh, share my screen and uh, use a few slides just to uh, raise a few points on this very important topic of uh, competitional and industrial policy post COVID-19. Um, so um, I only have three or four slides because I, I don't wanna spend a lot of time with slides and more time just uh, instead of talking about issues. And the questions I'd like to address today within the very vast general topic that has been proposed with the panel are three, and they are related to some recent research I have done on the topic. The first one is on price gouging in times of crisis. The uh, 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 practice, which uh, many of us have observed in the past few months, of certain sellers setting exorbitantly large high prices for goods such as hand sanitizer, uh, face masks, and 
in the past in other crises, things like water or gasoline or so forth. So that's the first uh, question I'd like to address. The second one uh, is what to do about GAFAM, about the power of the giant firms. GAFAM stands for Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft. Um, and what does COVID have to do with that? And uh, thirdly, what is the role for the state post COVID? In particular, is industrial policy back? Now, of these three questions, the first one is not very, very closely related to a, a competition policy or industrial policy, but it's very COVID related, of course. The second one is not particularly related to the COVID crisis, but it's certainly very closely related to competition policy. And the third one, well, it's kind of part of the bigger question, uh, uh, what is this all going to mean for institutions in particular for uh, the role played by the state? Uh, if you're interested, interested in more on, 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 on these issues, uh, there are two papers of mine that I will be citing today uh, and where you can read more about this. So with no further ado, let me first talk about price gouging. And so again, uh, the definition, there's not really a definition of price gouging, but you think about the idea of selling Perel instead of selling it for one euro, selling it for 40 euros, a factor of 40. And I'm not joking, I'm not kidding. Uh, that's the extent of the price increases we have seen in some cases in some states for some sellers in recent weeks. Um, is that okay? Should there be a law against that? This is probably one of the questions where uh, economists and non-economists are the most divided uh, traditionally. Economists typically think about the efficiency of markets, that market prices are the best way of allocating goods to those who need it the most. And, and, and in fact, if you look at um, a panel of economists in 2012, so the IMG Forum is, is a panel of uh, a variety of leading economists from uh, leading schools that uh, University of Chicago has created, uh, I don't know, about 2010 or even before that. And they regularly ask questions from their panelists. And the question that they asked them in 2012 was, should they pass a bill? This was a very specific bill in the state of Connecticut that would ban unconsciously excessive prices. So a bill to ban what's known as price gouging. And the answers are in blue. As you can see, by and large, economists disagreed with the idea of creating such a law. Uh, about three quarters of the uh, panelists would either disagree or strongly disagree with a law banning price gouging. But then here's the interesting thing. Just a few weeks ago, they asked a similar question, laws to prevent high prices, so laws against price gouging uh, for essential goods in short supply uh, would raise social welfare. Now, I have to admit that the question is not exactly the same. I also have to admit that the panel was not the same. Uh, this is not a balanced panel. There are people who've left the panel, people have joined the panel. Still, it is quite remarkable how eight years later, now you have the answers here in red, you have almost the opposite answer. Three quarters, almost exact symmetric. Three quarters either agree or strongly agree with laws against price gouging, which is what uh, most of the public thinks anyway. So I start with this interesting observation that um, at least a group of economists who were, were inquired in this panel seems to be changing their opinion with respect to what they did about a decade ago and seem to be now much closer to what the public in general thinks about. Now, it's difficult to answer a question like this because there's so many qualifications you need to make. Um, let me just now give you some data about uh, what's happened recently with the price of uh, face masks in the United States. So this is part of a paper that I'm working on with, um, with uh, Le Chou. And um, here's the one interesting thing. So we split, this is, these are prices for a specific item. Um, so it's uniform product. Uh, there's no product differentiation across sellers. Um, in blue, I have the price set by Amazon. This is actually not the price. Let me, to be more specific, this is the price that they're setting as a ratio with respect to the price set last year. So one is you're setting the same price as were last year, as Amazon was setting last year. So that's why Amazon is at around one. 
uh, Amazon slightly increased the prices during the uh, uh, recent COVID pandemic. But what's most noticeable is that they ran out of stock. So if I'm not plotting anything in here in blue, that's because Amazon does not have the product. In green, you have what I define as incumbent sellers. These are sellers who were already selling 3M masks before COVID hit the US. And as you can see, they were setting a fairly constant price, uh, you know, not quite twice uh, as much as, as what Amazon prices, but a little more. And then what you observe is that they do increase prices a little bit to maybe three times what they were selling, what Amazon was selling the year before. It's a little bit of a spike in here, but in general, we can level three. And finally, you have a third group of sellers. These are what I call entrants. They're not necessarily entrants in the world of Amazon, but they're entrants in the sense that they did not sell 3M masks before the pandemic. And as you can see, these newcomers are selling at a considerably higher price, not only than Amazon, but also than ongoing entrants. So one suggestion that I've been trying to push in terms of policy is, you know, every few years we have a crisis, could be an earthquake, could be a hurricane, could be whatever. And whenever there's a crisis, there's a few goods that are uh, necessities and there's a big excess demand for them. And then we observe these exorbitant prices. And so the discussion comes back again, is it fair, is it efficient? Uh, this uh, 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 trade-off between efficiency and fairness. And what we see, however, is that Maybe this is not just about just supply and demand in the sense that we learn in Econ 101, because these ongoing sellers, these are typically large sellers who have a reputation at stake. They've been uh, selling for a long time. Some of the sellers that we have in here have almost 1 million reviews from Amazon, which means that they've, had, they've made many, many millions of sales on Amazon before. And so the market, as it were, already provides a fairly good mechanism for keeping these sellers in check. Because if they set very high prices, then Amazon will get back to them. So this is one first thing that I would like to uh, bring to the table uh, that perhaps the market doesn't do so bad in terms of ongoing sellers. What we need to do is to uh, be concerned with newcomers. So that's the first thing I wanted to talk about. Second question I want to talk about is the power of the large firms and, and uh, how to deal with them. This is one of the things that Raul brought up, uh, what to do about uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, perhaps also Microsoft. And this is another thing that I would like to talk about. Since the beginning of the century, this is uh, not about COVID now, this is way before COVID, these firms have been acquiring a lot of small firms. You know, as you can see, this is the number of acquisitions. If you take the sum total of this, it's already close to 800. If you were to include Microsoft, I think we get close to 1,000. That's a lot of acquisitions. And so uh, people are very concerned with the power of large firms and, and that uh, maybe we should be a little more careful. Maybe we should be considerably more careful about reviewing their acquisitions. Now, in the past, very few of these acquisitions were reviewed by uh, merger authorities in Europe or the United States. And in fact, uh, most of them are acquisitions of very small firms. And, and so the, the current tools of merger review probably wouldn't even apply to those mergers. And so there's, there's a proposal going on uh, uh, in, in the past uh, few months by quite a variety of authors. It's quite a lot of unanimity, I would say, well, near, not unanimity, of consensus, broad consensus amongst uh, the economics profession and, uh, and, and policymakers as well, that we should drastically change the way uh, uh, we deal with uh, acquisitions by large firms. And in particular, the idea that instead of the uh, merger authorities, DigiComp in Europe or the Department of Justice in the US, instead of them having the burden of proof that a certain acquisition will be anti-competitive, we should completely reverse that and force the acquisition parties, so Google and its target or whatever, to prove that their acquisition is pro-competitive. There's quite a, quite a broad consensus on that. 
I am probably one of the very few people who are in the minority disagreeing with that. And I think it would be it would be really bad for innovation, which is one of the topics we're talking here today, if we were to do so. I've been dealing with a, um, a number of startups. In, in, in fact, I'm one of the uh, mentors in a uh, um, startup accelerator in New York. And um, it's one thing that we observe is that, is that for many, many of these startups, their business model is to be bought by a large firm. And the moment you uh, create, you stifle the process of acquisition of small firms by large firms, uh, it may be very well intentioned, but you're going to have a huge negative effect on uh, innovation. And I think that there are many other ways of addressing the uh, GAFA problem, but I think it's primarily going to be regulation, not preventing them from acquisitions. So that was the second point I wanted to make. And uh, um, I see that in terms of time, I probably still have a few minutes, maybe two or three minutes. So let me talk a little bit about what I think is the third problem. The role of the state, that's another thing that uh, uh, broadly speaking, we're talking about in here. And I think there's a lot of confusion as to uh, what do we mean by the role of the state? And I think it's helpful to distinguish between two broad things. One is the state as a means, as an instrument of uh, social solidarity. And the other one is the state as a player in the economy, as in, for example, industrial policy. And frequently we mix the two of them. And I think it's a big mistake because I, for one, I'm uh, very much in favor of a very, very big state in the first sense the state as an instrument of, uh, of, of solidarity. Uh, but I'm a very, very skeptical person with respect to the role of the state in the second sense as a player in the economy. Uh, the other day I was uh, uh, listening to a talk by President, uh, former President uh, Duran Barroso, President of the European Commission, who said that especially now with Brexit, we're going to go back to a much more state-oriented economy because France and Germany, we have more of a tradition of a large role of the state in the economy, are going to be more influential. And we no longer have uh, the United Kingdom to kind of refrain and stop the European Union countries from doing so. Um, I think I agree and I disagree. I disagree in the sense of we're going to see more of uh, uh, the state uh, in terms of industrial policy. In fact, I think the European Union in the past 20 years or so has made an enormous progress in the direction of having a strong competition policy and of rejecting the model of the state as, as a player in the economy uh, in terms of national champions and other elements of industrial policy. And I, I, I think it's too far, we've gone too far down that, 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 that road to, to go back. So it's, even with Brexit, I think there is a culture. And remember that that culture has been primarily um, uh, um, strengthened by um, the European Commission and the uh, directors of competition policy. Of course, one was Sarah Len Britain. It was very important in the 1990s. But since then, we have a Spaniard, Joaquin Almunia, an Italian, Mario Monti. Uh, and then we have a uh, uh, first, first dagger, uh, uh, Danish. So, it's a philosophy of, of government, which is very entrenched in the continent. It's no longer just the United Kingdom. So um, this is a, more of a prediction uh, that I have in here. I don't think uh, we're going to have uh, the return of industrial policy. And in fact, I hope we will not. And so as, as a starting uh, a set of remarks, this is what I, I, I would do. And again, to uh, repeat, the three points that I'm trying to make is uh, price gouging, Perhaps the market can be used as a way to regulate that. Second, uh, what to do about GAFAM? Uh, certainly not to reverse the burden of proof in mergers. Uh, merger policy is not the right way to address that, in my opinion. And third, what is the role of state? Is industrial policy back? I don't think so, and I hope not. So I'll stop here now, Raul, and I will stop sharing my slides. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Luis Cabral. It was an extremely interesting speech. Now is the turn of Professor Xavier Vives from the ESA Business School. Now, the, again, the screen is yours. Okay. I see. Let's see.
you see the screen, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, so thank you uh, first for the invitation to participate in this uh, roundtable. Uh, basically, I will um, uh, put my remarks in the industrial policy uh, domain. Um, uh, but le let me first remind quickly uh, all of you um, what will be the impact of, uh, or what I think will be the impact of COVID to, uh, to, to understand uh, what's going on. Uh, so most uh, likely, I think uh, COVID will imply an acceleration of previous tendencies, like low interest rates in the macro realm, uh, a deepening of uh, digitalization, an increased dominance of uh, big tech, something related to what uh, Luis was talking about, will continue and will deepen the reversal of uh, globalization process with increased protectionism everywhere. This is happening everywhere. It will have shorter and closer uh, supply chains, a national production of essential goods, in health, energy, food. Uh, just uh, note that, um, for example, uh, in uh, some uh, some of the pharma products like uh, uh, paracetamol in uh, in Europe is produced uh, basically in China. Uh, the high tension drugs in the U.S. are also produced in China. So this will end. I mean, um, uh, with for all certainty, uh, countries would like. Given what has happened now, countries would like to uh, secure the supply. Uh, at the same time, there will be a change in the sector weights, the cleansing effect of the current crisis, obviously all the online, e-commerce, telemedicine, home delivery, all the biotech, health, pharma, so this will go up and a lot of restructuring. Okay, And also increased importance of lifting lagging productivity, in particular in the Western economies, R&D, human capital. And the weight and the role of the state will go up. So, uh, and I, it will go up, I think, in the, in the um, sense that uh, Luis uh, will not like it. That's my impression. Okay, so the, in industrial policy, um, and as in many other policies, like for example, uh, energy policy, uh, there is a triangle of objectives and in which involves trade-offs. So we want, um, the firms and the economy to be competitive and uh, consumers to have a wide variety of products and to be cheap. Uh, we want everything to be delivered and produced in a green way, so respectful with the environment. And we want also to be secure, uh, basically uh, in, in terms of, for example, securing the supply, securing the energy supply, uh, securing the inputs for the production or securing the food, etc. Uh, obviously, the, um, the COVID, uh, what uh, will imply is that this vertex will become much more important. And in fact, we will add another um, component, which is correlated to security, but not exactly the same, which is uh, resiliency. So in fact, we, we, we would have uh, no, another geometric, geometrical form no, uh, with four vertices, not, not three, maybe. But just to simplify, I, I put this one. Uh, this one here. So this will become prominent. And this is what will drive, in part, industrial policy. Obviously, also industrial policy will be driven at the intervention of the state by competitiveness and by environmental concerns, uh, green deals to, uh, to understand, right? So resilience is added as an, uh, as an objective and modifies the trade-offs between uh, the, different, uh, uh, the different objectives. The consequences are that the control of the strategic industries, which are in large in number, uh, are very important for the countries, for the, uh, for the states. And also what's very important, ownership will matter more. There was already a tendency, but ownership will matter more. The control of foreign ownership will matter. In the US has always mattered. I mean, the US has in, in theory been very liberal, but not in practice in terms of uh, foreign ownership. Uh, Europe has been much more uh, liberal, but now this will change. And also there will be a fostering probably of national uh, champions in part in the name of uh, national security. The, uh, the classical rationale for industrial policy has been, uh, well, it, there are many things, no, uh, basically, but uh, the economic foundations in terms of mm, trying to alleviate market failures, uh, one is picking winners. So this has been relatively discredited. 
but others not so much. I, I put in, uh, in bold the ones that most likely will be uh, of the rationales, of the existing rationales in industrial policy, most likely will be um, uh, enhanced uh, by COVID. Uh, one is a strategic uh, trade policy to gain market share in foreign markets, transfer home monopoly rents. The other is the coordination of, invest of investment and setting of standards. For example, if you want to have a booming or, or a, a growing electric car industry, you need to coordinate investments. And the market, at least in Europe, is not really doing it. So now that's why uh, there are several initiatives to try to push for, uh, for example, the electric car uh, in Europe, supply security, uh, and health this now has become obvious, but in energy also, uh, national security, uh, US policy is basically driven by national security and the China security threat, uh, as we've seen uh, in the US. And obviously we have then other, much other, there was the old infant industry argument, the low nuclear, lo local externalities to, for, uh, for industrial policy, global externalities, the control of uh, climate change. And, and we know that uh, there are many drawbacks of these uh, policy interventions, quite a few um, related to political economy, poor barrel authorities, capture, uh, protectionism, uh, etc. The tools, uh, let me not, uh, I, I will just uh, jump over this very quickly. Uh, there are many tools, you know, tax evasion, exemption, subsidies, standard setting, antitrust exemption, merger policy, location advantages, public procurement policy, state ownership, public private partnerships. There are many tools that the countries have used, and the states have used to, uh, to intervene. What about in a crisis? Okay, so if there is a positive role for industrial policy in a crisis, is to facilitate, like uh, the post-COVID crisis or the current crisis, if you want, is to facilitate the movement of resources from declining and obsolete uh, industries and sectors to emerging and uh, viable sectors. Could be maybe also to try to push to green for, for green technologies. You know? For example, now if the cars are in trouble, do we have to give subsidies so that diesel vehicles uh, survive? That's a question, right? Um, there are dangers. If you help as now, there is massive help to firms and industries in difficulties, this may confuse cycle with trend. That's to say the cycle may be just that it's because the COVID shock that they have suffered a demand shock, maybe also a supply shock, that but they are still viable, or there is a trend, a declining trend in this firm and in this industry. Uh, help has to be very uh, careful, okay, not to uh, induce uh, zombie firms, no, as the Japanese uh, experience uh, show. Political economy uh, problems are important. Declining uh, sectors, for example, uh, tend to lobby harder because the rents are protected from entry. And then now there start to be all kinds of proposals, no? uh, like ban on foreign acquisitions during the pandemic, ban on big taking over the small in the US. No? There are uh, no? uh, senators thinking uh, uh, along this way. And let me just uh, finish with some remarks uh, about Europe. Why there is no big tech in Europe, basically, or mostly, okay? Why Europe lacks in artificial intelligence? Is size really uh, important? Is because merger policy is too tough? There was a famous Siemens Alton, Alston case which was blocked by the European Commission. Uh, I don't think that's really the case. So the, uh, so the, the big reasons uh, is basically that there has not been uh, enough investment in R&D, and this, uh, basically has not been uh, enough public support to R&D in Europe, I would say. And very importantly, because Europe still in services in particular is a fragmented market and data scale economies today are huge. Are only the US and China, they are really profiting from them. But Europe is still a fragmented market and, and this, is a, uh, uh, this is an obstacle for uh, firms to develop. And also is fragmented public procurement, as, as I as I now, in Europe, there is quite a bit of uh, worry about the distortion of competition from foreign state uh, uh, control firms, like, for example, China. And there is this change of heart in which uh, the, the minister of uh, Refortin, Colbert, wins, even over Germany, that was not uh, very convinced. 
and now Germany joins France in in really trying to push for some kind of more concrete industrial policy and even uh, European champions. The, the Siemens Auto push uh, France German was a, a French German uh, push was uh, was an example uh, of that. Germany saw like uh, how their investments in solar energy uh, when uh, I mean basically they were not very good when when China subsidized the industry and took over complete and so. Uh, so this, I think, made Germany uh, think twice about industrial policy. Now, in the in uh, last year, um, uh, the, uh, the European uh, Commission, the European Union, started a foreign investment screening tool, uh, which uh, allows the EU countries to intervene in cases of foreign direct investment in strategic assets. This is, I mean, as you may imagine, China is in the background. Uh, because it is in particular it carried out by state control and state finance enterprises, which uh, China is the uh, best uh, example. The Commission has no power basically to deal with that without legislation. And now, in fact, now post COVID is also thinking about legislation. And today uh, the Commission uh, issued a, a white paper, as I will explain in the next uh, slide. Uh, the European Commission also now approves what they are called important projects of common European interest which are exempt from state aid and competition rules for strategically important projects. And these are initiatives which try to push, for example, for the electric car, to build uh, batteries, 5G, artificial intelligence, all the things in which Europe uh, is, lagging, um, is lagging behind behind in the name of technological sovereignty and, in the, um, and to be placed in the, the value chain in a strategic uh, position. Post-COVID, uh, as you know, the European Commission has suspended the state rate rules so that uh, firms and industries can be held. There are lots of health packages. I would not go into that. And there will be an important recovery fund, which is still to be decided probably in, in July. But then today, the Commission issued this white paper on foreign subsidies. I have not read it yet. But basically, it's to prepare legislation. And in the words of the Commissioner, uh, the Steger, uh, she says that we need the right tools to ensure that foreign subsidies do not distort our market, just as we do with national subsidies. So now the European Commission cannot do much uh, with the current uh, legislation. Apart from that, the health packages uh, put the following question in, in Europe. There is a potential distortion by a state aid of the level playing field because fiscally strong countries that accumulate a high proportion of uh, health, the approved health, for example, 50% is German, um, and that those uh, countries, Germany, France also, uh, may support uh, what they call strategic industries, airlines, car, etc., much more than others, like, for example, Spain. And, and, and this has an effect, and definitely uh, it produces some distortions. So Nissan has just announced that it will leave its, uh, its factory in, in Barcelona, so this has created some Commotion. Uh, while uh, a while ago, I remember you know, that UK before uh, uh, Brexit uh, made undisclosed promises uh, to Nissan, and so now Nissan is saying that it will leave uh, Europe except the UK. Uh, in any case, so one of the important things uh, issues to keep in mind is how to keep this level playing field, no, to avoid the state aid distortion uh, of competition. We know the distortionary uh, effects of, uh, of potential, uh, the distortionary potential of A. Uh, I will not, uh, I, I will leave it here. Um, we know that it can uh, be uh, bad for competition and at the end uh, for efficiency. So just uh, what competition policy should do uh, now well, now competition policy is uh, important to keep markets open, foster and keep integration. I'm thinking also of uh, Europe. Uh, uh, avoid uh, the, in a sense, uncompetitive uh, mergers, remove artificial uh, barriers to movements of resources, allow the winning out of an efficient institution, um, check the distortions introduced by rescue uh, packages, and also an increased advocacy role in probably again and another long phase of tighter regulation and public uh, intervention. 
Um, so this is basically uh, what I uh, wanted to, uh, uh, to tell you. So the message is that both industrial and competition policy have to be uh, complements, have to work together. And, and what's important is to, to allow, uh, if there is industrial policy, uh, and that there is some uh, case to be made for that, uh, it, it has to uh, be uh, thinking uh, how the markets uh, will uh, keep being competitive uh, once uh, this uh, industrial policy has been uh, put in place. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Xavier Vives. Also, very interesting lecture on this topic. Now we have uh, the third panelist in this session, who is Professor Pedro Mendi from University of Navarra's Economics Department. Pedro, the screen is yours. Um, hopefully, thank you, Raúl. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Raúl. Uh, well, uh, I, I, I don't have uh, slides, uh, but uh, um, uh, and I, and I uh, saw that both uh, Luis and, and Xavier actually uh, said a couple of ideas they had in mind to, to talk, so I'll, I'll pass over them. So I want to uh, focus on, on two, two main ideas. Well, uh, one is uh, the, the main effect that I see on, uh, of COVID-19 on innovation. And the other main idea is, uh, you know, uh, what are the main challenges that uh, innovation policy post uh, COVID uh, might face, right? Um, so regarding the first point and the effects of uh, COVID-19 innovation, uh, uh, the, I, the way I see it is, uh, well, I, first, I, we have seen an, a very big increase in uncertainty, okay, which is detrimental for investment in general and for investment innovation in particular. Um, so the other, another effect uh, would be the disruption of uh, supply chains. Uh, also, Xavier has mentioned that um, this this may be regarded as short-lived, uh, but uh, but it might it might have uh, it may have some long-lasting effects uh, in the line of uh, relocalization of economic activities and some of it uh, partly associated with additive manufacturing. Um, another effect uh, that I think uh, it has uh, on on uh, investment and in general innovation in particular uh, would be well all these uh, measures that uh, have been introduced uh, uh, social distancing uh, changing consumer preferences and the like consumers being afraid of certain uh, habits or certain goods and they might change their preferences uh, uh, but uh, and, and kind of we can we might observe some sort of flight to safety in consumer behavior so to speak uh, uh, I think these are these are um, temporary uh, effects, um, but uh, they might introduce distortions uh, in the economy because they might lead firms to make uh, wrong investment decisions. Um, another effect uh, would be how the halt in merchandise trade and FDA flows. Okay, so um, well, just like in, in any crisis, well, the, the merchandise trade has has. Uh, uh, Stopped, uh, uh, not not uh, fully, but uh, but significantly, and so and especially FDI, uh, FDI flows have been have been halted, um, and it's important for innovation because multinationals are important carriers of uh, technology overseas, uh, both to host countries, the countries that receive an investment, and uh, from the receiving the host countries to the to the home countries, uh, and this effect may be. Might be relatively more important for developing countries that uh, that are more reliant on, on FDA flows. Um, well, another another effect of of uh, of COVID nineteen uh, that has to do with innovation is all right. So so this this we can we may regard this COVID nineteen as a shock that has uh, created or introduced a shakeout in many industries, um, and uh, we we. We have observed, and we will observe in the in the near near field, near term, uh, a lot of firm entry and exit. Okay, uh, and perhaps uh, this this might be leading to to new business models. Okay, um, and I think uh, it, this is important because it is important to understand uh, who enters and who ex exits in this industry. So, is it the case that the most efficient firms are the ones that stay in the industry, or uh, is it is it not? Is it the, the entry and exit process driven by uh, other considerations. 
perhaps, and, and maybe uh, Xavier might have, uh, might have have some comments on this, we might witness some uh, more concentrated industries, okay, in the hands of your players, okay, that might uh, relate to the to the recent work by Xavier on, on common ownership. Um, so the idea here is, okay, so we have experienced like a, like a huge shock and uh, this shock is, is shaking many industries. So what's gonna happen after the last settles? Um, all right, and, uh, and I would like to highlight a couple of uh, extra effects uh, on, uh, on, of COVID uh, on innovation uh, that I think uh, whose consequences are, are kind of more long lasting. Uh, one is the uh, one is the effect of of COVID nineteen on on public finances. Okay, so we're gonna witness a debt crisis, uh, especially in Europe. Okay, um, uh, and especially in certain countries within Europe. Um, so I think that that's gonna have a detrimental effect on on R and D. Okay, so on the one hand, uh, corporate R and D expenditure will. I expect it to, to decrease because uh, of the direct impact of the of the crisis. Okay, and, uh, and on the other hand, uh, governments might have more pressing needs than than funding uh, innovation projects. Okay, so there's going to be a competition for funds uh, uh, be between innovation related projects and other projects that might might have more political appeal uh, for for governments and might be uh, more urgent. Uh, okay, just to maybe. Uh, um, get uh, try to get out of the, of the situation of, of crisis. The other effect, and it, it's kind of related, uh, it's kind of related with the previous one. Um, in response to this, uh, this potential stress on private, public finances, um, uh, and this is something also that Xavier also mentioned, uh, this, uh, the, another impact of COVID-19 is, is an increase uh, or, or a low, that low, low interest rates are, are likely to stay longer than expected. Okay, so it's the impact through monetary policy. Um, so, well, uh, we were expecting at some point to abandon the uh, zero interest uh, uh, policies, but that, that looks like this is it's going to take longer than, than we thought. Um, and um, and this fact, uh, well, this basically a zero uh, or low, very low interest rates and. Uh, and uh, zero uh, and um, uh, this this low interest rates is 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 kind of um, implies that that investment in capital is going to be uh, cheaper. Okay, and uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, COVID nineteen has highlighted the fact that uh, that robots are not affected by pandemics, um, and uh, uh, an effect of that, a combined effect of that is is that uh, this might induce firms to choose technologies that are more intensive in capital. Okay, so we're, we might uh, observe some accelerated automation. Okay, uh, and this, and, and I think this is huge. And, th and this, this, this is not really new uh, um, because automation uh, was uh, was very big uh, pre-COVID. Okay, before uh, March this year. Okay, so we were in the in the in a, in a wave of accelerated automation, and I think uh, uh, the monetary the monetary uh, policy response to that. Um, and the very impact of COVID is going to, to accelerate that. Um, okay, so this is, these are the main, the main uh, um, effects of, of, of COVID, the way I see them. Um, and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce just a couple of ideas about, um, about um, the main challenges that innovation policy post-COVID phases, okay? So the first question, and this, uh, you know, this links with uh, the, the, the comment made by, by Luis at the beginning, is well, whether, whether or not we really need industrial, uh, you know, industrial policy in general and innovation policy in particular at all, okay? Um, well, we know the, the problems with industrial policy uh, in general is the lack of information uh, by the governments. It's not obvious that the governments know better than, than the private sector about future technologies. <laughs> especially when they do not exist yet. And the other effect is that of uh, political cap capture, okay? Uh, also, um, you know, how to avoid picking winners uh, and the problem here, specifically in the context of Europe, the, of whether we need national and European champions, okay? Um, just like the, the failed measure of Alston and Siemens uh, highlighted. Um, so, so that's a big question. So, so in principle, well, I, I'm, I'm 
personally, I'm, I'm kind of um, inclined towards, uh, you know, not needing uh, uh, or kind of anti-industrial uh, policy uh, and innovation policy. But but uh, the problem is that, uh, well, we have uh, an, another big player, China, that has a very strong and direct industrial and innovation policy. Okay, China has become, has gone from, uh, you know, being basically the imitator of the world to, in, at some, in some areas, being uh, uh, at the frontier. Um, and uh, well, and, and on the other hand, we have uh, we have the United States with uh, with the uh, the GAFA firms that uh, are leaders. Okay, um, we have a lot of innovation entrepreneurship. Um, so we we should think about doing something uh, related with innovation. Um, this link leads um, or this links with uh, with um, a big problem that is. Um, uh, that, that I mentioned before is that this COVID-19 has uh, is, a, is an event that had that has happened in a, that is being framed in a wave of automation. Okay, and this wave of automation is one of the factors responsible for the loss of middle class jobs uh, across the not only in Europe but also in in the U.S. Okay, and uh, and and the an innovation and industrial policy. That uh, promotes uh, growth and create good jobs. Uh, uh, if, uh, I think it would be worth uh, worth thinking about it. Okay, uh, this will ultimately have a positive effect in lowering inequality, which is is something that is this also big in the agenda. Um, okay, um, just a couple of of final comments. I think I'm running out of time. Um, this, uh, I think, uh, innovation policy in any case it has to have a comprehensive view. So, so in order to foster innovation, science and technology policies are not enough. Okay, so innovation is not just the new technological discovery, uh, but uh, also finding the right business model. Um, so, uh, so, and, and in that sense, uh, competition policy and regulation play a crucial role. Okay, to, just to focus on free markets, uh, you know, not to uh, erect the uh, artificial barriers to entry so basically to get rid of anything that that basically hampers innovation and of course uh, in, and also linking with the previous comment on the on the wave of automation uh, automation is going well the effect of automation is, is kind of is, is kind of um, heterogeneous um, so it, it depends on the initial conditions in the country uh, but one thing is is for sure is that well automation will will very likely replace um, kind of not very productive jobs, uh, but it also create new jobs. So in order for that, for a country to take advantage of that, of this creation of new jobs, and not to get the negative impact automation, it has to have an indicative labor force. Okay, so uh, this leads to a question of well, do we have, for example, the required flexibility in the system of education to adapt to the needs of the of an evolving industry? Uh, and finally, uh, just a final comment. Um, do, well, um, uh, this is probably something that Luis will not like, but uh, um, so is there a, a, is there a, a role for of, for a massive government interventions and mission driven innovation? Uh, does Europe need its own DARPA? And uh, well, there's a, there, I came up uh, came across a, a nice uh, recent contribution by uh, Moretti, Steinbinder, Steinbinder and Van Vrienen, uh, suggesting that defense spending positively, positively affects corporate investment in R&D as well as TFP growth, okay? And they, they actually found uh, um, uh, public spending in defense, okay? So this was specific for the case of defense spending uh, to have a, a crowding effect on private spending and positive spillovers, okay? Um, so, well, this, there has, there's at least some evidence that is suggestive of the of a positive impact of of uh, you know government led uh, innovation and big uh, investment projects. Okay, um, but again, uh, I'm I'm kind of like I would agree almost completely with Greece and in this line I would say that public private collaboration is essential. So we cannot have you know a purely uh, government driven uh, innovation. Uh, private, okay. So it's it's important this public uh, public private collaboration, as we saw recently uh, in the launch of SpaceX ro SpaceX ro rocket, okay. Um, okay. So so I think I'm gonna uh, stop here and uh, just. Uh...
give the floor back to Raul. Great, thank you so much, Professor Pedro Mendy. Also really interesting stuff. So now we're gonna move to the Q&A session. Uh, actually, there are tons of questions uh, for the panelists. I'm gonna start with, with a question for Professor Xavier Vives, actually a couple of questions by uh, Mrs. Irache Gulpegi. Um, so she's asking, uh, so in order to create and to incentivize European champions, which could potentially be Siemens or Armstrong, should, uh, should the rules for mergers be changed in Europe? And how can we deal with these picking champions and not distorting competition at the European level? Yes, no, I am, I don't think the rules, the merger rules should be changed. So for example, in the Siemens Alstom the case, um, the companies were saying that they wanted to compete with the, with the China big company. But in fact, it was not even clear uh, that they would need to merge to compete with uh, this company. The, comp the Chinese companies basically works in China and uh, both companies, Siemens and Alstom, do not compete this much in third countries. Uh, so um, I, I, I'm not sure the, really that this is a good idea. Uh, rather the solution to the problems is more to integrate uh, better the market, to really have a uh, European single market, um, foster R&D and all the horizontal measures uh, to make um, firms competitive. More than that, more than uh, more than changing the merger policy. Another thing, the other thing is this issue of how to limit the control of stakes uh, of European firms by. Uh, public or state-owned, uh, for example, Chinese firms, which may be politically motivated even. So this is another thing, and, and this, this I think has to be taken seriously, and the security concerns, and also not only the security concerns, the concerns about technology and intellectual property have to be taken into account in this case. Great. So now we have a question for Professor Luis Cabral. So this is a question by Mr. David Ampuero. So you explained that it is mandatory for GAFA firms to explain if an acquisition is pro-competitive. So why would you say that this is harmful for innovation, the fact that they need to explain whether uh, the acquisition is pro-competitive or not? Yeah, that is a good question. In fact, I didn't have time to go through a lot of details um, the point is more of a point of, of for the United States legal system than it is for the European one. So in the US, currently the uh, burden of proof is on the plaintiff, which in this case is the Department of Justice. And, and that burden is actually quite heavy, which means that it's quite difficult to, uh, in court, in court, because that's how it happens in the US, to prevent a merger from taking place. In Europe, it's different because the uh, DigiCom, they don't have to they don't have to go to court to uh, uh, block a merger from taking place. Uh, and, and, and in that sense, it's uh, uh, slightly different in Europe. Nevertheless, uh, what uh, the proposals in the United Kingdom and in Europe and the United States have in common is to significantly increase the barriers to acquisitions of small firms by large firms. And I think that would have a very negative impact on innovation. So that part I can explain. You can go, you know, you go to Silicon Valley, or go to Tel Aviv, go to New York, go almost anywhere in the world, and you, you talk to a venture capitalist, you talk to a startup, and you'll find out that their business model or a very important part of their business model is the possibility of being acquired by a large firm. And the moment you create large barriers for large firms to acquire small firms, they're going to stop doing that. Of course they are, because it doesn't pay to do that. And all of a sudden, the incentive for startups to uh, to um, um, to in innovate the way they're innovating will be considerably considerably lessened, uh, and that also has, in my opinion, an important efficiency, of, uh, negative eff efficiency effect, because frequently the innovations that that these small startups create have much much greater value in the hands of uh, uh, large corporations than they have in isolation. So I think it would have a double negative effect. First, 
uh, considerably uh, lessen uh, synergies between uh, large platforms and uh, uh, new uh, innovations by small firms, and B, significantly uh, lessen the incentives for uh, innovation by those startups. And, and I, you know, I, let me just add that um, in the discussions that people have uh, regarding um, regulation of large firms, uh, everyone likes to talk about innovation. It's a bit like politicians talking about education. Every politician will tell you that education is my passion. Education is the most, everybody says that. I would be very surprised if I had a politician tomorrow said, uh, I don't think education is important. Of course, I mean, that would be very odd. And so everybody says that, oh, innovation is super important. It's very important. But then when it comes to uh, uh, actually looking at it carefully, uh, because it's so difficult to measure this effect that I'm talking about, it's so difficult to measure, it's largely ignored. And I think that's, uh, that's a big mistake. And, and uh, I, I am in a minority in here, I should add, as I mentioned earlier, uh, most people think differently. I think it's a huge mistake to ignore something you cannot measure, uh, but it's there. And I, I think it's important. I don't have a quantitative proof because it's so difficult to prove this causality effect, but I'm convinced that is enormous and it's a first order nowadays in particular. Perhaps it was not 20 years ago, perhaps it was not 40 years ago, but it's hugely important right now. Thank you. So let me stay with you because we have uh, a few questions about the one particular topic, which is price gouging. So they're asking, for example, Mr. Sergio Daga or Mrs. Shirley Cortez, how would you tackle this issue? So what is, what is, what is the regulatory measure that you will implement to tackle price gouging, whatever is face mask or bottle water, whatever item is suffering from that? I, I have a specific proposal, which is the following. Um, at a time of crisis, new sellers cannot sell for a price that's higher than ongoing sellers or perhaps uh, higher than 10% more or something like that. So my point is that because buyers have a means of controlling, quote unquote, controlling the prices sold by long-term sellers through the reputation mechanism, we should look at the prices set by large sellers and or ongoing sellers as a benchmark. Uh, and I think that's a good benchmark for fairness. How do I know what a fair price is? I don't know. It's very hard to show what a fair price is. My claim is that a price that buyers consider to be fair should be considered fair by society. Mm -hmm. And buyers consider that price to be fair because if it's not, and we know that there are many, uh, there's a lot of evidence of that, buyers will boycott the sellers. They will react. They know how to react. My problem is how to control sellers who don't have a reputation at stake. And my proposal is, use the ongoing sellers as a benchmark. That's mm -hmm. basically the idea. So let me finish with the very last question, which I think is a, actually a controversial one, which is for uh, Professor uh, Xavier Vives. So Mr. Neil Stockton is asking whether the success, uh, the success of uh, Zoom show us that we actually don't need industrial policy because we see that when firms are free to start up and innovate on their own, then this, we have there a success, successful story. So with that example in mind, why, would, why do we need industrial policy at all? Well, um, yeah, that's uh, always controversial industrial policy. Um, if you are in Silicon Valley, you don't need industrial policy. That's the answer. <laughs> but, if you are not in Silicon Valley and you have not done, uh, you, you, have, you don't have Stanford at uh, 15 minutes uh, no, uh, by car, then you have to start thinking about what you do. Or you don't have Harvard or MIT close by. And uh, one of the things, I mean, broadly understood, uh, no, uh, uh, Industrial policy may encompass you know, all these horizontal investments you know, in scientific research, you know, uh, R&D, et cetera. Uh, so, but obviously from there to uh, help to specific firms, uh, it's a very, there is a very wide uh, scope. I think there will be um, quite a bit of consensus on the first stages, okay, on these broad horizontal measures like labor market flexibility or, um, or uh, 
improved education, etc. No, uh, while then the, um, on, on on picking winners. So now uh, probably uh, few people would agree that this is a good idea. Okay, so so it's a range and depending where where you are. Now there is a little bit more of a mixture between horizontal and uh, and uh, more sectorial uh, policies. Uh, which point at the need to coordinate uh, uh, to coordinate efforts, for example, in, in on, on certain uh, uh, industries, like for example, for the electric car. No, uh, uh, where if you have a very dynamic economy, like in the U.S., maybe this is not needed. Uh, but if you have other economies, like European ones, with many frictions, uh, maybe this is needed. Thank you so much. So uh, I think we would love to spend we would love to spend like hours here on this topic. Unfortunately, time is over today for us. And I just want to conclude by thank uh, thank uh, Professor Luis Cabral, Professor Xavier Vives, and Professor Pedro Mendy. It's, it's been quite an interesting session, and I hope you all you can join for future sessions in this uh, stop and think uh, webinar series at the University of Navarra. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.